Hi there, Chalmers family. Pastor Bruce Jones here. This is the message for Sunday, October the 27th, 2024. Uh, Ruth and I are away uh, the next couple of Sundays, but uh, we I wanted to make sure to catch up on something where you uh, have been left behind. This would be the the group of you that uh, listen to these messages online. You remember back in the summertime, we were doing a series in the book of Proverbs, kind of systematically making our way through the book, picking out some highlights of various chapters along the way. And then all of a sudden, if you've been following along, you probably realized, oh my goodness, we had a gap there, chapters 22 to 24, uh, I've not heard about. And that's because when we went away on vacation in the summertime, I got back too late in the week to be able to record the message uh, uh, ahead of time for, for Proverbs 22 to 24. So, I wanted to record it so that you wouldn't fall behind. So hopefully you'll be able to glean some things from this, even though uh, it's kind of coming out of order. But uh, we'll return back to Proverbs for today, and I trust it'll be an encouragement to you. We see a little bit of a change to the structure that we've seen for most of the book up to this point, at least in Proverbs. And if you look on your sermon outline, we're calling this Proverbs Wisdom for Life. That's what we called the whole series all summer long. And uh, chapter 22 to 24 uh, would be the set of three chapters or the group of three chapters that I want to give you some highlights from today. Now, by way of recap, here's an important thing to remember. Proverbs are not promises necessarily, right? Now, sometimes these things come true, sometimes they don't. These are general sayings of the wise, general sayings that are based, uh, at least most of the book is written by Solomon, based on Solomon's observation of human conduct, his observation of and experience of what decisions generally lead to good positive outcomes in his life, uh, happy productive uh, times in his life, and what decisions often have led to regret and to pain and to difficulty. So there's, there's contrast in this book. It's wisdom and it's foolishness. It is, it is uh, good and bad. It is uh, wise decisions and poor decisions. It is the, the smart person or the person who applies uh, various things to his, to his or her life that are wise and the person who uh, is, uh, is a simpleton in the sense that they have have uh, neglected to do so, right? Take a look at your sermon outline that uh, you have for this morning, and uh, we see, as I mentioned already, a little bit of a change in these chapters. If you remember up until now, most everything, well, just about everything, has been written directly by Solomon himself. But not all of the Proverbs in chapters 22, 23, and 24 are written by Solomon. In fact, beginning in chapter 22, verse 17, uh, Solomon gives credit to others by calling the rest of this section till the end of chapter 24, sayings of the wise. Now, these, this would probably mean that most of these things had their origin from someone else's uh, mind. And Solomon is just adding them in because, hey, these things are wise to be added to. But the main theme remains. The main theme, regardless of whether it was Solomon or somebody else, the theme is get wisdom. No matter what it takes, get wisdom. And we'll also see in here uh, one particular passage that says get wisdom, get discipline, get understanding. All those things go together. Wisdom, discipline, understanding. How to uh, make wise, active uh, decisions based on the information available to you. How to live a disciplined life and how to be able to understand the implications of various codes of conduct. So, you know, the idea is search for these things. Search for wisdom, for discipline, for understanding. Search for these things as if they are hidden treasures, because they are treasures for one thing, but they're not always easy to find, in the, and that is what makes us think of them at times as being hidden treasures. There are some highlights from chapters 22 to 24 that I want to share with you today. And like I say, uh, some of these sayings are attributed to others, and some of these ones that are attributed to others uh, actually give more detail than just one verse. 
Often in Solomon's Proverbs, it's just one or sometimes two verses long. Bang, 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 and then bam, off to another thing. And so you're popping all over the place with all different kinds of topics being brought up. But I find some of these other sayings of the wise make it a little bit easier to glean, glean a few more insights uh, from them simply because there's a little bit more detail. For example, here's one, and it's a little bit of a humorous one, but perhaps you might be able to relate to this with experiences you may have had. In Proverbs 23, verses 6 through 8, a little bit more drawn out and longer than some of the other Proverbs, it says this, Do not eat the food of a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies, for he's the kind of man who's always thinking of the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten, and you will have wasted your compliments. <laughs> How about that, eh? Uh, I think that's very uh, kind of uh, humorous, but at the same time, oddly interesting that uh, it may come out that way. But though other people may glean different teachings and different applications from chapters 22 to 24, I find there are three main themes, then three main highlight themes that uh, come to me and that have numerous different uh, verses and proverbs from uh, throughout these chapters relating to these three themes. And the first of all, the first theme is this. Uh, I see here proverbs about the delicate art of raising a family. Any of you who have ever had the opportunity to do that will probably attest that it is a delicate art if we want to do it well. The delicate art of raising a family. And this starts with probably the most well-known verse in all, or the most well-quoted verse in all of the Proverbs about child-rearing, and it's chapter 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. You may have heard an older version that says, train up, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let me tell you, this verse, friends, has been the thread, and sometimes it's been a skinny, thin little thread that many, many Christian parents have held on to when their children have walked away from God. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We hold on to that thread. I mean, none of us are, are perfect. Our parenting has always had aspects of imperfection. We have our own strengths. We have our own weaknesses. Uh, maybe we've done a, done a good job in parenting in certain respects, but have been lacking in other respects. And so none of us are perfect examples of parenting. All of us have our own foibles and have committed our own sins in the process. But ultimately, Christian parents long for their children to also love and want to follow Jesus. It boils down to that. We want our kids to love Jesus. We want our kids to follow him as well. Christian parents long for their kids to wrestle with Jesus about issues of life and priority and come out on the side ultimately of deciding to, to, to follow Jesus. No turning back. But Christian parents throughout time, friends, have just agonized over their own kids' decisions or what seems to be their own children's decisions to walk away from God. Forget about this. I don't, I don't need him. I don't want God. I'm going to go my own way. And you know, as we think about that, and I've shared this with numerous different Christian parents across the, the, the ages, <laughs> uh, in my years in ministry, and I've, I've reminded myself of this from, uh, on occasion as well. A couple things with regard to this verse. Number one, it doesn't say when our children are young, they won't depart from the way of God. It doesn't say that. It says when they're old. That, some, that, that, that implies that there may be a time when they are young where they do walk away. Yeah, and many youth, many young adults take the opportunity to assert their own independence at some point along the way. And often part of asserting this independence takes the form of seemingly thumbing their noses at God. Yeah, whether they actually say that or not, it seems as if the priority of following God falls by the wayside. And you know what they're usually thumbing their noses at is something about the traditional church that may or may not actually have been inconsistent with biblical Christianity, but something that they just don't like or something that rubbed them the wrong way about Christians or about a church or about a particular church or about one or two or a few different views that that church might have on things. And this, I, I tell you, is all the more reason 
for the faith life of Christian parents to be truly based in a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Are we going to get everything right all the time? No. Are we going to be perfect? Of course not. But when we, when our, our life is a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ, not simply a blind following of religion or a blind following of religious patterns that mean nothing, a blind following of tradition, young people, friends, are experts at sniffing out hypocrisy. Whether it's the hypocrisy of their friends or their church background or what have you, sometimes even their own hypocrisy. So it says here, when they are old, they will not depart from it. As our wandering children age, many, if not most of them, if they've grown up in a consistent Christian home, will come back to the truth of the love of Jesus that they walked away from at some point in their youth. And we can pray and live and work and move and talk and trust that that will be the case one day. The second thing that I kind of lean on with regard to this verse, this train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not turn from it, um, it would, would back us up even a little bit more. Who am I to think that I can even walk away on God anyway? Doesn't scripture assert in many places that God dogs my every step? I mean, I cannot get away from him even if I were to try. If I have truly decided to follow Jesus, if I've accepted his sacrifice to pay for my sins, if I've become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, if I've accepted this gift of eternal life, if the Spirit of God is living within me, then Jesus says that he is my shepherd, and Jesus says that no one can snatch me out of his hand. No one, not even myself. I cannot snatch myself out of the hand of God when I am in his hand, even if I may want to. That, friends, is mercy. That is grace. That is an incredible thing to try to wrap our minds around. Even if I wanted to wrestle myself out of the hand of God, I can't when I've accepted his gift of salvation. Wow. So friends, even if you have kids, if you have grandkids, if you have other young ones that you love and that you've agonized over, or maybe perhaps you have older parents or grandparents or, or people that are older than you that you've agonized over because they seem to not care about God right now, don't despair. Never fear. Trust God. Pray for these people. Let God do the incredible work in their lives to bring them back to a full experience of the love of God and a relationship with Him. Hang in there. Trust and pray. Here's another passage about the delicate art of raising a family. This goes over into chapter 23, verses 12 through 14. It says, apply your heart to instruction. It says there in your sermon outline. You can take a look at it. Apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. Now that's an interesting beginning, an interesting talk about uh, corporal punishment, right? It's a companion to the old proverb, spare the rod and spoil the child, which is linked, which is linked to and sort of finds its, its beginning in Proverbs 13, verse 24. We don't have time to consider the, the, um, the relative merits and drawbacks of corporal punishment. Different people have different views on that. Perhaps a parenting seminar might be better to talk about that. But what the, the, the point that this ultimately makes is that one of the key things that a child needs to know is that he or she does not rule the roost at home, right? Parents do not exist for the sole purpose of catering to their children's whims and giving in to their own uh, children's every cry. Right? Sometimes teaching discipline to a child and instructing a child in what is right and wrong in terms of action and thought, this is not an easy undertaking. Sometimes it is just plain torture. Sometimes the kids feel like it's torture. And sometimes, I tell you, the parents feel like it's torture. I never understood the old saying, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, as it relates to discipline just before a spanking. I didn't understand just how, 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 how that could be true. That a parent could say, this is going to hurt me more than you. Until I became a parent and had to find ways to get lessons across to my kids that would actually work. 
corporal punishment just for the sake of getting your anger out? No, that's not the idea. Never, ever, ever in anger. Um, but the idea of figuring out what works to help discipline and rear my children, boy, that is agony at times. Proper discipline of children will, though, pay benefits, pay blessings to not only the child, but the whole family in the end as well. And we actually see some of the fruits of careful child rearing in these chapters as well. Take a look at chapter 23, verses 22 to 25. The last one I want to share about this uh, delicate art of raising a family. It says, listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. And here it says, get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who is a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad. May she who gave you birth rejoice. Oh, to be able to rejoice and take good godly pride in our kids and in our parents, as that verse would suggest. It is not impossible and it is never too late. Now, I have implied all the way along in our series this past summer, if you remember, that if you would take 10 different pastors, 10 different Bible teachers, and give them the opportunity to preach a series in the book of Proverbs, you would get 10 different approaches, you get 10 different methods, 10 different strategies, and probably 100 different verses that they would, they would use as, uh, as, as Bible verses to use in a series like this. All, but we would all eventually arrive at the same outcome or the same theme, which is the theme of wisdom. The importance of wisdom. How to detect what would be wise to do. How to discern and figure it out. How to deploy wisdom in one's life. The importance of wisdom. Now we see wisdom uh, uh, expounded on in a whole different theme in the next repeated chorus that I see in chapters 22 to 24. Number two on your sermon outline. These are proverbs about uh, another delicate art. The delicate art of handling money wisely. The delicate art of handling money, handling material goods wisely. And all of these proverbs are actually short ones, interestingly enough. Chapter 22, verse 1, the first verse in this section, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And we're going to see that verse talked about uh, in a slightly different context in a moment. But this was spoken, a good name is more desirable than great riches. That was spoken by the richest man in the world of his day. Sometimes we don't take this in, but Solomon was the equivalent of a multi-multi-billionaire of today, right? Think of the richest person in the world, whoever that is. That is, or that the equivalent of that would be Solomon. And he realized that in the end, money and having money and living for money does not satisfy anywhere close to knowing that you were esteemed and respected by others because of your character, not because of your wealth. That kind of thing cannot be bought or sold. A good name, character, cannot be bought or sold with any amount of money. But practically speaking, as it relates to money, a few verses later, chapter 22, verse 7 says this, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now this isn't a statement that's meant to chide or shame anyone, it's just an observation that the one who lends money to others is always the one who has the upper hand, right? I mean, when we owe too much to too many, we feel as if we become a servant to all. So the implication of this is no matter how long it takes, no matter how hard it may seem, the encouragement here is to get out of debt. Right? Uh, the, because the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. That's just an observation of the truth that existed in the world back then and that continues to exist today. But even as we struggle to keep our heads above water financially, we have to continue to remember that God is always the one who performs what I call heavenly economics when we choose to be generous with whatever we have, however much or little. Uh, look, just look at what Jesus says in, in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It talks about give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, shaken down, poured out into your lap, 
you know, for with the measure you use, this is talking about in giving to God and to others, Jesus says it will be given to you. But for an Old Testament sort of interpretation of this, check out what Solomon says in Proverbs 22, verse 9, just a couple verses after the last one. He says, A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. A generous person will be blessed themselves because they share their food with others. We should always be giving to God, always be giving to others with however much or little we have, because we can then watch Him work to meet each one of our own needs when we are generous and hold what we have with an open hand so that God can take what He wants to use to bless others. And He will always pour back more into us than He's taken. At least that has been my experience. So to sum it all up, the wise man says, the wise man says in chapter 23, verse 5, and I love the word picture. I love the, the picture I get in my mind of this. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. I wonder if you have thought of material resources in that way. Perhaps you've experienced it, right? Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone. They sprout wings and they fly off to the sky like an eagle. I have to make sure that my gaze, that I am not too intent on, on money and the acquisition of resources. That I'm not consumed with material things. I mean, it's like, you know, because if I'm consumed with that stuff and with acquiring more and uh, amassing more and, be, and, 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 and bringing a fortune into myself, the more I clamor for that, the more it gets away. It's like, dry sand poured out of an hourglass and I'm trying to catch it with my hand, it all just slips through. Or, or, or like trying to corral the mists of the morning into one great big, you know, one great big fog hug. It's impossible because it just slips through and it's gone. The more I clamor to hold on and amass uh, wealth, the more that I will only see it drift away and be gone. I wonder if this kind of thinking was some of the beginning of some of Solomon's more cynical thoughts that plague his book of Ecclesiastes. Most Bible commentators and scholars believe that Solomon um, was the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. He just identifies himself as Kohaleth, the teacher, but uh, most believe that it, that, that it was actually Solomon. And in Ecclesiastes 2, verses 18 and 19, Solomon says, and this is, this is great, this is another passage that causes me to smile a little bit, more because I can understand just how this how this could be a conundrum for him. He says, I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I poured my heart and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. He goes to talk on to talk about a, a chasing after the wind. I have to leave all this stuff to somebody and who knows whether he's going to make wise decisions or not. Well, as it turns out, Solomon's own son, Rehoboam, who ruled uh, in, after Solomon, in many ways did not rule wisely because it was under Rehoboam's rule that this glorious kingdom of Israel in, in experienced uh, civil war and split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And uh, so in many ways, Solomon's worries came true. But riches, this is talking about, can surely sprout up wings and be gone. Uh, and that further reminds us that we cannot find our ultimate pleasure, our ultimate hope, our ultimate happiness in money and wealth, material things, because uh, there's just not enough value in those things to hold our attention. So I am gripped by some proverbs in these chapters, 22 to 24, about the delicate art of raising a family, about the delicate art, secondly, of handling money wisely, and then there's a third category. We see some proverbs about the another delicate art, the delicate art of wisely approaching our work and our personal reputation. Our work and our reputation. And these ideas are related, right? Our approach to work will enhance or detract from our reputation in the community as well. So uh, there, there's a delicate art in knowing how to work but not become, uh, you know, overly addicted to work, how to not become, you know, 
to, to sloughing off work too much? How does that relate to the way other people see me? And that kind of thing. And the, 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 um, the first verse that I see that talks about this category is one that we've already talked about. And it's worth repeating. After having everything a man could ever want, Solomon had. In fact, he had it many times over. And after all that, he confirms that having a good name, having a good reputation is worth more than any riches. In chapter 22, verse 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. The importance of character and reputation over money. Now, there's another uh, uh, number of verses touches on a very different way that one can develop a reputation. Uh, the sermon outline says in chapter 23, verses 29 through 35, uh, that the, this passage is a very descriptive passage about the pitfalls of alcohol addic addiction and how you can gain a reputation, how this affects your life, how this affects your work and your quality of work and all those things. Chapter 23, verses 29 to 35, listen to this. It's kind of written in a humorous way, but you can see the agony and the pathos in all this too. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and it poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on the top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They will beat me, but I don't feel it. When will, will I wake up so I can find another drink? <laughs> well, this kind of sounds like the description of a happy drunk. But as opposed to an angry drunk... Uh, you know, this person does sound happy, but ultimately gaining a reputation as a happy drunk isn't really something to be proud of either, is it? And this usually reflects who we choose to spend our time with, who we choose to allow to be the largest influencers and speakers into our lives. The people we surround ourselves with will have a measured influence on our lives and through that on our reputations. We need to choose our friends wisely because they will affect our work. They will affect the legacy that we leave behind. How about chapter 24, verses 3 and 4? Your sermon outline, I think, only says chapter, or verse 3, but it's 3 and 4. I might have, maybe I've, maybe I've corrected it. I can't remember. But anyway, 24, verses 3 and 4 says, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Do you get that? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. By wisdom, a house is built. And through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. This is talking about, essentially, a life well put together. And these verses show us how wisdom and understanding and knowledge go together, these three things, because they are three different things. It's not three of the, uh, the of, you know words describing the same thing. These are three different things. Wisdom is the culmination of it all, but uh, the other things have to happen as well. You see, understanding, I mean knowledge, first of all. What is knowledge? Knowledge is simply the facts, right? Knowledge is having the facts, knowing the information. And then understanding is the ability to discern what the facts mean. And how they fit together in the overall big picture. That kind of makes sense, right? That's understanding. You can have a lot of facts, but if you haven't put it together in your mind as to what those facts mean, that they're just facts. But then wisdom, thirdly, is knowing how to apply your knowledge and, uh, and your understanding to your life translating it into useful and productive ways to live. Wisdom is really the act of decisions and the action that comes out from knowledge and from understanding. For instance, let me give you an example. In keeping with the theme of the pitfalls of improper alcohol intake, just to sort of keep with that theme, 
Knowledge would be knowing that alcohol impairment occurs when one breathes over 0.08 on a breathalyzer test. Now, I hope that you and, and, and myself will never ever be in a situation where we will have to breathe, do an, a, a breathalyzer test, because that in itself is, is um, you know, not something anybody would want to have to go through. But knowledge is knowing that when you breathe over 0.08, that, um, that uh, that's when alcohol impairment occurs. Now, understanding is a step deeper. Understanding is when I realize that if I breathe po over 0 0.08 on a breathalyzer test, I am in big trouble, right? You know what the impairment is, and understanding is knowing that you're in big trouble if you do that. Now, wisdom, then, would be making decisions ahead of time to make sure that that would never happen, either by deciding to not drink at all, or by making sure that I've got a designated driver with me for those who still want to drink but do so responsibly and you know that you have to be driving somewhere or going somewhere, right? You can make wise decisions and still drink alcohol. I'm not saying that you can't drink. But we need to be wise about it, right? So that's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom and how they go together. And when knowledge and understanding and wisdom work together, that's where you'll find a house, a home, a life, that is built and established and strong. Lastly, I want to return to something that we've read before that relates to work and reputation. And you'll remember this from uh, earlier on this summer when we talked about this. Here it says in chapter 24, verses 30 to 34, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds. My garden is covered with weeds too. Not because I've ignored it, just because, you know, weeds tend to grow. But you know, what this guy is saying is that this person has not done his job. The stone wall was in ruins, he says. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed Man, do you remember us talking about that? The, those last uh, words uh, from a little bit earlier in the book. The idea: I need to apply myself to be diligent, to be watchful, to fulfill my responsibilities to the best of my ability. You see, all throughout this book, we see that wisdom involves careful attention and thoughtful planning. Wisdom does not happen by accident. Part of growing in wisdom is steering clear of the things that can easily ensnare us. And I want to kind of leave this, leave you with this idea today. What are the things that easily ensnare you? What are those things? Can you list maybe one or two or three things that, that, that can often get you into trouble? What are things that can take your eyes off of God? What are things that can pull your affection away from God? What traps do you easily fall into. I didn't share this uh, live on Sunday morning, but one of the traps that I fall into sometimes, I have three or four different word games uh, that I like to play online every day. Wordle and Quirtle and Connections, if you've ever done that. And even Octortle. I don't know if you've ever done any of those word games. Helps to keep my mind sharp. I fall into the trap sometimes of doing some of those word games in the morning, before I've started with my Bible reading or done my devotions. If I'm not careful, an hour can be gone just like that. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I haven't spent my time with the Lord yet. That's a trap that I could easily fall into. So even just the, just the other day, I kind of, I was thinking this and I thought, you know what? I need to make sure to get at my devotional time. Do my devotions, my Bible reading, my time with God first before getting into doing those little word games that sharpen my mind for the day. Because I know that's a trap. I can end up wasting an hour on those things. Especially if you start looking on Facebook or whatever, you all of a sudden your, your morning can be gone if you're not careful, right? Those are kind of traps that we need to beware of. What things easily ensnare you? The recurring themes of today's section of, of Proverbs, 
which suggests that issues surrounding raising a family, even for maybe those of you who are grandparents, issues surrounding family can sometimes be difficult to deal with. I mean, the whole task takes all of the energy we've got, and it is such a delicate art. The issues surrounding the handling of money can also be, uh, include lots of pitfalls for us, right? We are too easily seduced by selfishness and greed. And if we're going to handle money in a way that pleases God, we've got to realize that it is a delicate art to being able to handle money wisely, responsibly, and in a way that honors Him. And the issues surrounding our work, our friends, our reputation in the community, the legacy or the example that we want to set, these issues also call for a very delicate hand and a careful commitment to living wisely as well. Let's live with full understanding of information, the information and the facts we see every day. Let's have an ability to understand those things and the implications of those things. And let's also make wise decisions, not only just in our families and and uh, in our handling of money and our reputations, but in all areas of our lives for the honor and glory of God because He wants, uh, wants to do good for us and wants to bless us through making wise decisions. Let me just pray, and then our time's gone for today, all right? Can you bow your head with me? Father, we're aware, I'm aware of at least some ways that I'm led astray. Some of the traps that the enemy uses to ensnare me, some of the ways that I unwisely live. Lord, we too often make decisions based on what feels good in the moment, not what really is good for us in the long term. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me for such short-sightedness. Forgive anybody watching today for our short-sightedness in this way. Lord, help us to get the facts right. Help us to have the knowledge of the truth. Help us, to, Lord, to develop the proper understanding or the ability to then discern the, what that knowledge means for us. And God, would you help us to have the wisdom that allows us to make proper decisions, to make godly plans based on the understanding and the knowledge that you give us. We seek your wisdom and we want to apply it to our lives. Lord, we need your insight. We need your help to live in that kind of way because it doesn't come naturally. We need you. God, would you please honor your own reputation? Would you take control of our own lives? Help us to live in a wise way for the honor and glory of our Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, friends. I hope you have a great rest of your day today. Uh, remember, uh, let me leave you with this. The oldest psalm, Psalm 90, was written by Moses hundreds and hundreds of years before David wrote any. <coughs> but, excuse me, part of the, one of the important verses in Psalm 90 says, Teach us, this is a prayer, the psalmist is praying, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May that be your prayer today and every day. God bless you folks. We'll see you soon.